All right, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for coming to our session on uh, the on AMP, the audiovisual metadata platform. My name is uh, John Dunn. I'm Assistant Dean for Library Technologies at Indiana University Bloomington, and am uh, have served as Project Director uh, for the Audiovisual Metadata Platform, or AMP, project for the past uh, several years. And I'm Sean Averkamp. Uh, I'm a senior consultant with AVP, and I'm a project manager on the AMP project for this phase, as well as a subject matter expert. So uh, we were just recalling that we had uh, planned to come to San Diego two years ago for CNI to, to give a presentation on AMP. So it's, it's great to, uh, to be able to actually finally uh, do that uh, in person with all of you. We have given some updates uh, in the past, kind of in the original conception of the project and then some of the work that we had done uh, during the second phase. But uh, here we're going to talk about um, a few things. We're going to provide some basic background and context on the project for those of you who aren't familiar with it. We will talk about uh, what we accomplished and learned uh, in the last phase of uh, the AMP project and, and talk about the goals and work uh, for what we're currently doing uh, and, and where we see it going in the future. And I should uh, say this is a project that has really been a partnership between uh, Indiana University, uh, AVP, uh, New York Public Library, and uh, in phases one and two, uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and has been generously supported uh, by a series of grants uh, from the Mellon Foundation. So we thank them very much uh, uh, for uh, the, making this work possible. So um, first we'll talk a bit about background and context. So AMP is a project that's born out of a challenge that uh, we were seeing at Indiana University, um, but that others who are dealing with large volumes of AV, uh, audio and video, uh, and I, I, I lump uh, motion picture film in that as well under, under the rubric AV, even if that's not technically uh, correct, but for purposes of this presentation, essentially time-based media, audio, video, film. Um, and the fact that uh, uh, their AV collections and the interest in AV collections uh, on the part of scholars and for use in teaching uh, is, is growing uh, exponentially. Uh, libraries and archives are dealing with large numbers of, of AV materials in legacy formats that are uh, becoming challenging to digitize or reformat, uh, but also cannot continue to be preserved in their current forms. Uh, either due to media uh, degradation or the obsolescence of the equipment that can play these formats back or both. Uh, at the same time, as I mentioned, the expectations and, and demand for these collections is growing, and uh, user expectations for discoverability and access are growing based on uh, people's experiences with video on the web, in streaming platforms, on YouTube, on Vimeo, et cetera. Uh, and uh, libraries uh, are, and archives are needing to step up the discoverability of collections to make them uh, more usable and useful for, for teaching and for research. The challenge in that is that often uh, there's not a lot of metadata, particularly for archival uh, AV collections, and in many cases, um, uh, certainly at Indiana University, units that hold a lot of uh, AV materials have not necessarily even been able to view or listen to these materials if, to describe them if they wanted to because of the issues of uh, format degradation and obsolescence that I mentioned. So um, it's hard to improve discoverability uh, without, uh, without metadata uh, and at the same time, you know, resources for traditional approaches to cataloging and archival description uh, are limited compared to the volume of, of content we're, we're having to deal with. So the opportunity that we're trying to address uh, through AMP and other uh, related projects uh, at Indiana University uh, is um, to take advantage of uh, the fact that uh, uh, one can take a mass digitization approach to AV in the way that, say, Google you know, took uh, uh, for books um, and really do uh, did take a digitized first approach and then work with the see how we can work with the digital files then to better enable description, um, rights determination, um, and, uh, and so on. And so uh, we have had a project at IU that uh, wrapped up, or is actually still in the process of wrapping up, called MDPI, the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, uh, which has digitized about 
300,000 plus pieces of audio, video, and uh, motion picture film uh, media. Uh, but uh, the, the level of description and metadata that exists uh, for these collections varies substantially across uh, units. So for example, our music library has very rich metadata, at least at the item level, um, for a bunch of their material. But we have uh, ethnographic collections, uh, university archives collections that are much less rich uh, in terms of, of the metadata that's available. Uh, and you know, IU and there are a few other places that are taking this similar approach at this point to um, really uh, taking an all-in approach to, to, to digitization of AV collections that are encountering similar problem. And so we have this problem, and then at the same time, we have uh, uh, the opportunity of having these things in digital form and the fact that machine learning-based uh, tools and other automated tools to, to try to extract um, potentially you know, uh, uh, meaning and information from, uh, from media files are, are emerging from multiple directions and, and uh, uh, potentially uh, able to help with this problem. And so that's really what we've uh, tried to do in AMP is, is to look at how can we leverage uh, machine learning and other automated uh, tools together in workflows with human expertise flexibly and uh, in a way that can be configured to be appropriate to different kinds of collections, the kinds of um, uh, work you would do with a uh, music uh, you know, concert performance archive would be quite different than what you would do with an oral history archive in terms of the kinds of, of processing that's needed. And so we wanted to be able to uh, build um, uh, uh, workflows that are appropriate for, um, for the collections. So the vision of AMP has been to create an open source uh, software platform to really help with metadata creation and uh, augmentation for uh, AV collections that lets one build these workflows that combine automated and human steps. Um, a little bit of vocabulary definition that's gonna be important to the, to the rest of the session here. Uh, MGM is a term we use to refer to metadata generation mechanisms. Uh, this can be any, any uh, tool or step that creates some sort of metadata um, for, uh, for an item or a collection. It might be an automated tool such as uh, speech to text uh, it might be uh, a human or manual tool, such as um, uh, correcting the output of speech to text. Uh, and it might run in a local computing environment. Uh, it might run in a supercomputing or high performance computing HPC environment, or it might be a, a cloud uh, service. And so we wanted AMP as a system to be able to handle the integration of all of these different types of services. And then ultimately deliver metadata that could be used in what we call target systems, which would be online discovery or access systems such as uh, 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 archival finding aid discovery system, a library catalog, um, AV access platforms such as uh, IU's Avalon or uh, AVP's Aviary, and so on. So we have had uh, undertaken three phases of work so far. The first phase um, back in 2017, 2018 was a planning effort that really kind of developed and refined this initial concept of AMP, uh, convened a, a workshop of a number of experts to help inform the technical architecture and design of AMP. And there's a white paper that came out of that. Uh, all of the, the documents that we'll reference here and, and a lot of the documentation are available on our wiki and we'll, we'll put up the address uh, at the end uh, again for that. Uh, and then from 2018 to 2021, uh, which was extended a bit uh, due to the pandemic, we really sought to build enough of this AMP system uh, to be able to test it, start to test it with actual real collections, real librarians and archivists um, to see is this idea that we have, is this approach truly feasible? Uh, and there's a white paper uh, report that came out of that uh, that talks about that work, and I'll go into a little more detail on, on that here in a minute. Uh, and then currently, we're on our third phase of AMP um, that has been funded by, by the Mellon Foundation, working to develop additional components of the system to improve the usability of the system, to work on packaging and deployment issues so that this could be used by others, uh, and testing with a, a broader set of collections. And Sean will talk about uh, that current work on phase three in a minute. Um, but before then, I'll talk uh, about what we accomplished, what we learned uh, in uh, phase two over the past several years. 
Uh, and phase two was also referred to as AMPT, the AMP pilot development project. So we were, we were AMPT to work on AMP. Um, so the, the main accomplishments of, of this last phase were to actually develop you know, the initial version of the AMP application. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of that here in a minute, but it, there's two main pieces to that. There's a web-based uh, user interface uh, that's written in Java and uh, in JavaScript that um, allows uh, archivists and librarians to interact with the system to, uh, to upload or load in content to uh, run workflows against that content uh, and so on. Uh, there's a workflow management and execution kind of uh, back end to that called Galaxy. Um, that I will show here in a minute uh, that we adopted um, from uh, the uh, actually the computational genomics bioinformatics community uh, that, that uh, we use as kind of the workflow back end. Uh, and then uh, Sean led this piece uh, evaluating and, and implementing uh, a variety of MGMs, these metadata generation mechanisms, automated tools, tools requiring human intervention. Um, and really developing a, a pretty substantial evaluation of rubric to, um, to select those tools. And then we tested with 100 hours of audio and video from each of three collections, two at Indiana University and one at uh, New York Public. So this is just a screenshot of the AMP application as it currently stands, which you're not going to be able to, to read a lot of that, but this is a dashboard screen where um, uh, one can see what uh, uh, files have been uploaded, what the status of, of workflows uh, are uh, and actually access the output uh, from individual workflow steps. So this is something that's more useful in kind of a uh, sort of a direct work with the system for debugging and understanding workflows and so on. Ultimately, we would see this feeding into a discovery system or an access system, as I mentioned, such as, as Avalon or Aviary or, or other platforms. Uh, this is a screenshot of the Galaxy system. So Galaxy, as I mentioned, comes out of the bioinformatics community, and it was uh, uh, a tool designed to, to, to allow uh, researchers to create workflows that integrate multiple processing steps that might run in different computing environments um, uh, to process uh, genomics data. Uh, but it's been, uh, it's been adopted by a number of other communities in particular, um, the computational linguistics community uh, has an international kind of infrastructure for doing computational linguistics work that uh, utilizes Galaxy. And we learned about Galaxy from a uh, project somewhat complementary to AMP uh, at uh, WGBH Archives and Brandeis University in Boston called CLAMS, which is applying computational linguistics approaches to um, uh, helping to create metadata for AV resources. And they had selected and adopted Galaxy, and we felt that adopting Galaxy would um, make sense for us as well and would eventually allow us to uh, share tools. So essentially what Galaxy lets you do is you can create wrappers in Python to integrate different uh, tools and processing steps, and then you can visually go in and chain these together into workflows that might, um, uh, might be appropriate for a particular need. So again, you probably can't really see this uh, but we're starting with an input uh, that might be audio or might be audio and video. We extract audio from that. We run it, in this case, through Amazon uh, Web Services Transcribe to get text. Um, there's a human transcript correction step, uh, and then that eventually uh, outputs a Web VTT file. So this is a very simplified example. Um, it doesn't get into uh, a lot of the MGMs that we integrated, but um, it gives you a sense of what, uh, what Galaxy can do. And this is just a screenshot of one of the what we call human MGMs, which are those, those steps that require human intervention. Uh, and we've worked to uh, integrate other tools as much as possible. So here we used an open source tool called the BBC Transcript Editor uh, from, from the BBC and, and integrated that into AMP um, so that it can be used for, for transcript correction. And so this is a, I won't go through all of this, but this is a list, uh, I will share the slides, can refer back to this. Um, later, but a list of all of the MGMs that we have uh, implemented and integrated with AMP uh, in various categories, speech-to-text named entity recognition, uh, video OCR, segmentation, uh, human correction, a, a few others. And, and uh, we um, made a deliberate effort to try to incorporate uh, both uh, uh, open source and at least one open source and one 
a commercial cloud tool in each category uh, to be able to offer options and to be able to compare those. Um, and uh, the selection uh, of these MGM tools for integration was really based on uh, evaluation criteria that included a number of different um, uh, uh, different considerations, so accuracy of the tool, what, whether it could support you know a variety of input formats, the output formats that we would need, um, the uh, uh, you know amount of uh, processing time and, and computational resources that was required, the ethical uh, and societal uh, social impact considerations around the tool, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Uh, cost, uh, support burden. Um, the ability, you know, having an API abilities to integrate it and looking at whether it was a case where we could use a pre-trained tool or whether we actually needed to do machine learning training in order to accomplish a particular goal. So some of the things we have learned uh, in, this, in this last phase of work, you know, one is that this choice to work with these proprietary tools um, led to both benefits and, and challenges. So. Some of the challenges we encountered uh, with uh, commercial cloud uh, machine learning kind of pre-trained tools that are out there from uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, IBM, um, Google, and others is, is the degree sometimes of unpredictability from run to run because these tools are being improved and, 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 and changed over time. Um, certain undocumented behaviors such as filtering out particular words uh, in one case that was unexpected and undocumented. Um, and just not having visibility necessarily into what is, is happening, uh, kind of being a, a related issue. Uh, that getting into kind of the ethical and privacy concerns that were discussed a bit in the, the opening panel of this conference, one big difference we saw across the vendors of these services is how they approached the, uh, both the um, documentation and uh, contract terms uh, around um, what they can do with your data. So if you upload data to be processed, if you up upload data to augment training, will they, can they retain that for purposes of product improvement and use that for other things? Um, uh, or w w do they explicitly not retain that? Uh, is it an opt-in or an opt-out uh, sort of setting, Amazon? for example, is very much opt out. You have to tell them, don't keep my data, or they will. Um, uh, whereas uh, uh, IBM uh, and Google are the opposite, um, at least with the tools we were using. And Microsoft, to be honest, was very hard to figure out. And I ended up in an email exchange that eventually I was talking to someone in the general counsel's office at Microsoft trying to interpret their terms of use and what, you know, whether, what they really, you know, what they really meant in terms of this. So, um, so there are these challenges, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A, but of course these companies are investing huge amounts of money, right, into training and developing these tools. So for some cases, they work really well. So there's this balance here of benefit and, um, and some of these challenges. Uh, another area we dealt with is that we, we had a variety of uh, content that ranged into music uh, as well, and um, the, the state of the art for, for tools uh, dealing with music uh, much uh, less well-developed than those that deal with more textual sorts of content. And so that's led us to focus on more spoken word uh, uh, content for this next phase um, of work. Uh, there's this decision point, as I mentioned, about when we use existing tools and models versus training new models. So we chose, for example, to train our own model for applause detection to help segment uh, uh, concerts, music concerts, uh, because the existing models we tried weren't working well for our data. Uh, facial recognition as well. We we chose to do training of models for very limited use cases, like recognize this specific well-known person in the set of video, as opposed to more general application of facial recognition or using uh, uh, vendor tools um, because of some of those ethical considerations. And we can get into that in the Q and A a bit. Um, and uh, some issues with technical implementation. Uh, I can talk more about that if you're interested. Uh, and then librarian and archivist engagement, you know, we were really pleased to see that that archivists and librarians, special collections librarians, were very excited about the potential of AMP, um, both at IU and MYPL, but then starting to think about how does this get practically implemented in workflows? What can I do with the output beyond just what can I put in a MARC record or an EAD? 
uh, is a more challenging you know, uh, conversation um, because they haven't worked with these kinds of things before. And Sean will get into a bit more about how we're engaging them in this next phase. And so to transition to that, talking about our current uh, work on AMP, which is funded by a new grant uh, from Mellon uh, that runs through the end of this year, we've really focused on um, you know, a number of different uh, areas to take AMP to something that could be used more practically in production both at IU uh, and, and elsewhere. And Sean's gonna talk a bit more about that. Thanks, John. Um, so as John said, we're doing a lot of work this phase on improving the user experience. And for this round, we're partnering with managers of collections from underrepresented cultures and populations so we can broaden our understanding of concerns around impl implementation of machine learning tools. And so we can surface some new issues uh, with the existing implemented MGMs. Uh, we also wanted to work with partners who represent a range of different sizes of collections and use a variety of different uh, systems for description and access. So we're working with a diverse group of partner units of different sizes at both IU and at NYEO. Uh, so based on the progress and feedback from our previous phase, we're focusing this phase on workflow creation. So that's allowing users to create and edit their own AMP workflows. Currently, you can only do that through the Galaxy backend. Uh, we're working on batch upload of files, uh, improved navigation of collections, and also using intermediary files as inputs for MGMs independently from the predefined workflows, such as uh, using a transcript output from speech to text as input for names entity recognition. We're also improving and expanding our human MGM editing tools, uh, like John showed that the transcript editor. Um, we are adding video to the Avalon Timeliner tool, which we've been using for human editing of named entity recognition results. Um, and we're at adapting it for use with other tools like audio segmentation and face recognition. Um, and yeah, so we're also improving the open source BBC transcript editor, which is what we, we based our transcript editor on. It has needed significant customization to in integrate that into AMP. Um, we also learned from our users that the human MGM tools need to be available independently from the AMP workflows. So currently, uh, to use the editing tools, you need to set them up as part of a workflow and connect them to a JIRA instance, but we realized that like with the intermediary files, we needed AMP to have more flexibility for users to be able to process files through MGMs incrementally rather than making users plan out a full pipeline. So to engage our collection managers, we've been using a number of different methods, uh, system demos, hands-on training, discussions at all team meetings, and targeted discussions around topics. And we'll be conducting focus groups and some more formal user testing as we develop new features, uh, and as we have more to show users, whether that be completed features or wireframes. And we've gotten some great feedback so far. Um, so we, we, for example, we just led some focused discussions with two groups of collection managers on file upload and data export to better understand the needs for both smaller and larger size organizations for manual or automated upload to the system, as well as for exports of MGM outputs and uh, trying to find out what the most useful data formats would be for both humans and for machines. Uh, so from that uh, conversation, we learned of a variety of different use cases for getting content into AMP for processing at different points of the acquisition to access lifecycle. So archivists may want to process files in AMP at the start of an acquisition uh, to use the tools for streamlining accessioning decisions. Archivists, catalogers, or metadata librarians might want to use AMP tools during description to add valuable metadata that they wouldn't normally have time to create. And after items have been described, right staff might want to use AMP to help them make rights determinations to provide the appropriate levels of access. And finally, even after access, um, for the many media items that have been minimally processed or described in finding aid, say, uh, researchers might request access or further information that could require some on-demand uses of AMP. So depending on where a file might be at a given point in this pipeline, what system it's currently sitting on, what identifiers have been assigned to it, and what permissions are required to access it. Each of these cases uh, might present special needs for getting files into AMP. So this will require that we make sure our data model and our APIs can accommodate the necessary flexibilities 
uh, in who might be initiating uploads, where the files are coming from, and how they should be identified in AMP. For data export, we've learned that some of the formats that we've already created are already a big hit, like these contact sheets that we're generating for shot detection, face recognition, and video OCR, uh, which our collection managers think will be useful not only for archival processing and description, but also for making available to researchers so they can preview content that uh, can't be accessible remotely or it could just be an efficient way for them to quickly scrub through content. We also heard a need for automated export of data rather than just on-demand download uh, for hypothetical workloads or uh, workflows that involve pushing large volumes of files through AMP uh, and having the MGM outputs accessible from a repository location by a staff at any point in the archival processing or description pipeline. So now that our collection managers are finally starting to work with their own content in the system, we've been getting some great feedback on bugs or unexpected output from MGMs. And I'll just show you a couple of examples here. Um, so for example, uh, with the open source shot detection tool, Pi Scene Detect, uh, one of our collecting units discovered the MGM was generating excessive numbers of shots on some areas of video without content. Uh, with speech to text transcription, they found that Amazon Transcribe MGM was making some strange transcriptions during areas of silence. So you can see here where it seems to be finding the words, okay, okay, thank you, okay, which maybe that's outside the range of human hearing. I don't know. <laughs> um, but both of these examples represent cases that might be uncommon with the content that the models were trained on. Uh, but as we all know, these are very common cases uh, with archival content to have these gaps in content on media. So surfacing as many of these types of issues as possible will help us with tailoring workflows, creating workarounds, uh, or at least documenting these known risks for future users uh, so that we can improve the output before we release AMP. And this brings us to one of the other big additions to AMP in this phase. So in phase two for the pilot, one of the most important things we learned during our evaluation and selection of MGM tools was that accuracy can vary so drastically for a tool depending on the media content and how those levels of accuracy translate to quality will be different for every use case. Uh, so for example, a 30% word error rate for speech-to-text transcription may be unacceptable for using a transcript for captioning, uh, but it might be good enough for keyword search. So we recognize that future AMP users would benefit from being able to test tools on their own collections to make more informed assessments of both the values and the risks involved in applying the tools, rather than using any of our minimal assessments as recommendations. So what the evaluation module in AMP uh, is going to do, it'll allow users to upload ground truth data for one or more files that they run through an MGM, and then use built-in tests to computationally compare the MGM output against this ground truth uh, or ideal output. Um, and then they'll generate quantitative scores like precision and recall, and then they'll be able to visualize those results. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with how this kind of ground truth testing works uh, for AI, uh, we've got a link on our wiki to another presentation that uh, goes deep into this topic. So these are all just early wireframes, but as an MVP, we're envisioning a simple visualization interface like this that is generated dynamically from the ground truth test outputs and will let the user view bar charts or box plots to view and compare quantitative results uh, for one or more outputs for one or more tools. We're also working on a view that will let users qualitatively review the comparison of MGM output to ground truth so they can better understand how MGMs are failing on their collections when they're trying to determine whether or not to apply a tool or figure out what kind of workarounds or quality control mechanisms that they need to apply. So having worked with these AI tools in phase two, we on the core team understand the value of building evaluation support into AMP uh, in helping users to integrate AI into their workflows confidently and responsibly, but it's been very challenging to conceptualize what these evaluation tools should look like just by interviewing users about their hypothetical use. So I think that with this evaluation component, we're gonna see something similar to phase two, where we experimented with tools within the core team and then tried to generate ideas and feedback collection with collection staff 
Um, but we just showed them demos and results. And it wasn't until they were able to start working in the system themselves um, that we really started getting actionable feedback. And we even st started seeing users get excited about using these tools. Um, so our hope is that once collection staff are able to easily start using the tools on their own and have mechanisms for exploring the quality of the results, they'll learn how to use these tools to their advantage and then begin to materialize a practice of responsible use of AI. So probably this first version of this evaluation module will need to be improved after users start working with it. Uh, but we feel that's one of the benefits of this iterative development and we are gr very grateful to the Mellon Foundation for enabling us to build AMP in places like this. Um, so finally, we're working on packaging AMP for easier deployment, especially for organizations with minimal IT support. So we're taking a multi-tier approach to developing packaging with the end goal of creating a containerized environment. So the first tier will be being able to install AMP directly on an, uh, an operating system with help from detailed documentation and installation scripts. Then the next level will be having component level uh, containers. And then finally, we'll have some scripts and configuration to bring all of the containers up together. Um, so we're still finalizing our packaging strategy, but in the meantime, anybody can try uh, deploying AMP in its, its current uh, in-progress states um, at your own risk um, with our source code GitHub. Great. Thanks, Sean. So I will just wrap up uh, real quick uh, talking about some of uh, some of our ideas, some of my ideas about where this will go uh, in the future. Um, one is that that from the packaging work that, that uh, Sean described, um, you know, we hope to, to see some other institutions start to experiment with the platform, start to provide feedback, uh, potentially, hopefully, um, you know, start to, to buy into it in some way in terms of integrating additional tools or, uh, you know, improving deployability and so on. You know, potential, I think, for, there's no, this is all Apache licensed open source. There's potential for software as a service models for, for offering something like this. Um, we hope to work on integrating additional MGMs and, and uh, target systems uh, for output of, of metadata. Um, you know, looking at additional opportunities where we could best achieve results by training our own models. Um, uh, building on what we did with applause detection into some other areas, uh, which could include more work with music. I see that as a whole other project uh, that would kind of bring the music information retrieval community folks together with libraries and archives who are working with tools like AMP to take some of what exists in the research space and turn that into more productionizable um, uh, tooling to support um, processing of, of uh, uh, archival music collections. Uh, we want to uh, uh, build integration with IIIF to be able to take the output of AMP, uh, turn it into web annotations and IIIF uh, presentation manifest to be able to make it more portable to other tools uh, and then participate uh, as much as possible in this kind of emerging community uh, around, you know, AI and machine learning uh, uh, tools and workflows in libraries and cultural heritage, including through the AI uh, for LAM uh, community that if you are not familiar with, uh, you can Google that, that uh, AI for LAM and find out more. So uh, that is it for the presentation. Uh, if you want to see more about, uh, read any of the reports that we mentioned, see the documentation on evaluation of the different MGM tools and, and, and uh, so on, uh, you can go to go.iu.edu slash AMPPD uh, to, to get to our wiki and um, feel free to contact us directly as well. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And uh, we'll open up for questions. So we do have a few minutes uh, uh, for questions before the next presentation starts at 11.15. Hi, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, where the metadata lives and how it links to the essence, whether it's linking to segmentation or it's linked to uh, uh, time code or a set of time code, things like that? Yeah, so uh, internally, AMP uses a custom uh, JSON schema to represent the intermediate and, and final results of, of workflows. 
And within that JSON, it references time codes. So um, yeah, the segmentation uh, or the terms found through NER or transcription are tied back to the time code in that JSON representation. The idea then is that would be transformed into whatever is needed to, to bring it into a target system, an access system or a discovery system. Sean, if you do wanna add anything to that. Uh, I don't know, I think you covered it there. It's, it's a, a schema that we, we came up with ourselves just kind of as we were building the system, assessing MGMs. And so we've been refining it as we, we go and um, you can reference that on the, um, the AMP wiki. But turning it into, as I mentioned, into to web annotations that reference time code um, um, could make that more portable. We are also working on kind of how does the, if someone has an, uh, say, a, a preservation system or a repository, and then we're bringing files into AMP from that, how do we reference back to the file in that kind of system of record, and so that then the output is tied back to that as well through, you know, essential use of identifiers. Um, and that's, that's some of what we're exploring with, with IU and with MYPL uh, is kind of what, there's a lot of local implementation decision around that kind of thing. So we want it, we need to be as flexible as possible in how we handle them. All right, well, um, this will give us, give the next presenter some time to set up because they start right uh, at 1115. So again, thank you for your time and, and uh, feel free to talk with, with us afterwards as well. If you if, uh, want us to elaborate or, or discuss any of this more, we're happy to do so. Thanks a lot.